Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, guys, let's get started. Uh, we're excited today to have Jake Pacheco. Uh, he's the co-founder of Offset, the makers of SpiceDB. Um, so part of the reason that I want to have this talk is because SpiceD is a permissions database, which I know nothing about, um, but they care about linearizability and point-in-time queries, which I do care about. So we're super excited for him to have talk about what they're working on. Um, as always, if you have any questions for Jake as he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and fire your question at him. And please feel free to do this at any time, uh, because it, you know, otherwise he's just talking to a vacuum by himself, and that sucks. So Jake... Thank you so much for being with us. Go for it. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jake, as you mentioned, uh, and we are SpiceDB. We're a flexible permissions database for the internet era. Um, a little bit about me. I am the CEO and co-founder of AuthZ. Um, we're building an implementation of Google Zanzibar. I'll cover what that is in a little bit. Um, before that, I worked at a bunch of cool places doing some pretty cool things. Um, most recently, I was at Red Hat came to Red Hat via the CoreOS acquisition and came to CoreOS via the acquisition of our last company, which was called Quay. Um, so yeah, I've been building developer tools and distributed systems for the past 15 years. Um, and this is what we're working on now. So you may be asking yourself, why do I even need a specialized permissions database? Um, fair question. So prior to thinking about this problem more formally, um, this is kind of like what people consider the state of the art. So you've got a simple table um, and it binds a user to some role, often scoped down to like a document or an organization or some, some lower level. And then in your code, you'll just query that table and interpret it in the source code itself. Um, so in the code example, I say, if this person is an owner or a reader, then allow them to load the document from storage. Um, some pitfalls of this, obviously, if the list of roles, which allows you to read changes, you need to change your code. Um, it's harder to do things like bring in uh, higher level groupings or higher level uh, ordering. But most people actually start with an ad hoc uh, authorization system. So uh, they start with something like this, they throw a few relationships in a database and they interpret them in their source code. As time goes on, uh, they realize that they're doing this over and over again, right? So you want to interpret the same relationships the same way um, in multiple places or from multiple different pieces of code. So you extract that into a library. Um, once the library is built, you can compile that into any of the services that need to do the same type of work. After that, people come to the realization that, well, I, I need to be able to ask questions about uh, other things potentially, or I need to be able to ask questions from multiple different microservices that might be built in different languages or might not have the data readily available. Uh, because in the library and ad hoc solutions, you need to be able to go and query the source of truth itself in order to make those decisions. So people end up with a network service. Um, there's a couple of different examples of these uh, out there today, um, but I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. Once you decide to make it a network service, you start collecting requirements. Well, what should this service do? Um, it should be multi-model. So it should be able to do RBAC just as easily as it can do point-to-point -point sharing something that you might see in like Google Docs, um, or Twitter, or YouTube. You want it to work across multiple different applications. Um, there's an example of this from Google where when you make a request, uh, when, when you send a link to a document in an email and the recipient doesn't have access to that document, um, it will warn you and it will say the recipient doesn't have access. You might wanna share it with them first. Um, you wanna have visibility into who can do what um, on what kinds of resources. And of course you want it to be correct. Anytime you make a mistake in calculating permissions, it's obviously security flaw and you'd like it to be consistent. And I'll talk about consistency sort of a lot. Um, I also identified that these are sort of like hyperscaler requirements um, or you may have heard the term enterprise requirements. Um, Google themselves have billions of customers. Um, they're doing millions of requests per second that all needed to be protected with a permission system. They're managing trillions of objects. They need to do it quickly. Uh, I'll get into just how quickly they do that. They need to be able to do it reliably. So people think about like 99.5% reliability as kind of 
quote unquote good or like table stakes reliability. But at the kind of scale of millions of requests per second, even 99.5% is 4 billion failures per day. Uh, so this is obviously not uh, an ideal user experience. And you also want to have the same data replicated everywhere in the world. So by default, if you look at like cloud provider IAM solutions, they're not regionalized by default. So this is like in, in AWS, for example, IAM is the only service where you don't pick a region before you, you set up your users and groups and roles and things. Um, so given these requirements or with these requirements in hand, uh, Google set out to write a system called Zanzibar. Um, in 2019, they published a paper about their work uh, and it lays out a blueprint for how to build uh, a system that meets those requirements, both in scale and also in multi-model and complexity and querying and things. So we're building SpiceDB. Um, fundamentally, SpiceDB is an open source implementation of Zanzibar. Um, from a database's background, you might wanna think of it as like Vitesse for permissions. So we're not actually doing the actual storage um, or indexing or querying per se, uh, that you might with like a Postgres or a MySQL, but we are building a layer that gives you this complex, rich data model on top uh, and makes it easy and efficient to access the underlying data store. So diving right in, um, here's our data model. So we have uh, an overarching schema, which defines the type of objects that you can read and write, um, the relations, and uh, relations are how data can relate to other data, permissions, which are how we interpret that data. And then the data itself includes objects. So objects are like nouns, everything is an object. We have resources, which are nouns that are used um, sort of on the left-hand side of a relationship. I'll give an example of that. Subjects, which are usually users. And then we have the relationships themselves, which are how these things relate to one another. So the schema, you can think of that like a uh, relational database schema. It defines kind of like the table structure or the holes where you can define these relationships. And then the data is all uh, relationships itself. So objects, like I mentioned, are any entity in the system um, and they're a unique identifier prefixed with an object type. So users are objects, um, documents can be objects, groups can be objects, videos can be objects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can think of it as like a node um, in a graph. In our schema, this is how you lay out your different object types. So this schema has users, organizations, and the sort of like fundamental uh, protection piece or the fundamental thing that we're trying to protect would be documents. Then we go into relations. Relations are the way that objects uh, relate to one another in a relationship. So an example of a relation is someone could be a member of a group. You could be an editor of a document. Um, you could keep track of who the uploader of a video was. And all of those uh, relationships could sort of combine to give you a sense of who is allowed to have permission to what. This is how we add the relations to our schema. Um, yep. So in this particular case, we have an administrator of the organization. Uh, we have a document has an organization that it's a part of. It has an owner who is a user and it has a reader who is also of type user. And then finally, we get to the relationships themselves. So relationships are you know, single pieces of data which express the way one user or one object relates to another object. So in Zanzibar and in our implementation, they're written as resource has relation to subject, um, but a human might read it. User Jill is an owner of the document with identifier 123. So a subject is when an object is used on the right-hand side of a relationship. It's usually used to represent a user, um, but it can also represent things like a group or a server, an individual machine, if you're trying to do a like CI workload, um, basically anything that you're kind of pointing to with these relationships. And the IDs that you bind to your subjects will usually come from an identity provider. Um, this user identifier below is actually my Gaia ID uh, within Google. It may or may not be the real one. I don't know if I went back and changed it. And then resources can relate to other resources. So this is where you get the idea of like nested groups or folders within folders, those kinds of things. In this particular example, we have a group called engineering and it has a member of the group security. So group security is a member of group uh, engineering. But we can also point to relations on other resources. 
So this is sort of a similar expression to the one that we just had. But in this one, we're saying that members of the group leadership, and members will often be users, uh, are considered managers of the group engineering. OK, this is all just kind of like a primer. Um, what are we really doing here with all of these objects and relationships? Uh, we're building a directed acyclic graph. So this is just a, a graph expression of the relationships between um, sort of people and documents and people and organizations. Um, this is an, uh, a graphical version of the table that I showed sort of back on slide five or something. And finally, we need to talk about permissions, which is the real reason we're all here, right? Everything before this was just building up to being able to compute permissions. So permissions interpret the graph in order to make access control decisions. So I've added two permissions to the schema that we've been building up. Um, I have the edit and the view permission. The edit permission says that anyone who is an owner of a document or people who are administrators of the organization that the document belongs to should have the edit permission. And then the view permission is computed by saying anyone who is a reader of the document and also anyone who has the edit permission already. So in that case, we inherit uh, the edit permissions uh, downstream relationships when computing uh, the view permission. So if we wanna visualize that as a graph, uh, I have these sort of like synthetic nodes added in where we can just say that edit or view kind of point to these other things. Uh, and we can use this to kind of visualize the traversal of the graph. Um, our schema also supports intersection and exclusion which I thought I would point out because all of our other examples will involve unions because they're easy to visualize and reason about, but exclusions also give you some very powerful primitives for expressing permissions um, in an interesting way. In the top example, I've added users who are banned. Um, and you can see that even if you were already a reader and would otherwise have the view permission, if you've been banned, that permission has been removed. And then for intersection, this is kind of a contrived example. Um, but intersection would be like all users who have signed the license agreement and the users who otherwise have view would be allowed to fork this document, whatever that would happen to mean um, in this particular permission system. So basically when people come to you, like, like I mean, this sort of setup here is like you, you users have permission to read, read right? Like I imagine there's some common pattern that like, you can almost like give someone like, a, here's, the, here's like a starter template and they can fill additional things. Is that how people use this or do they have to write everything all this from scratch? Yep. Um, if you go to our playground, which is just at play.authsed.com, we have a couple of examples that are built in. We also have dedicated blog posts to um, common patterns that we've uh, sort of found from different users who are integrating this. So like one common pattern would be um, having a super user admin. Uh, so then you have to bind all objects to like a platform level object and then make an admin on that platform object. And then you can include that transitively in all of the downstream permissions. So yes, there are definitely common patterns. Um, we do, a lot of people would say, well, why doesn't the user, well, like, why don't I just get a user model for free? Why do I have to define that? And the answer is because not all permission systems even have users, right? You can imagine something that is like completely machine to machine or you could imagine something where the users are not the terminus of the permissions computation. So like we have a permission system that we use that terminates at tokens, like access tokens instead of users. So users are just an intermediate. So it's fundamentally up to like the user to define how all of these things will play for their particular application, for their particular permission system. I guess another question is, because like I know nothing about this space, like is this, you know, this definition language you have here, is this completely unique to Zanzibar when you guys are building or like, it, you know, do other systems that sort of bark in, up the same tree have something their own thing and maybe, maybe the dialect is slightly, like slightly simple, but how should I understand the novelty of this? Yeah, um, the Zanzibar paper lays out sort of like a raw version of this, um, which I'll, I'll get to, or I guess I won't get to it because it's very hard to understand. But our schema that is a DSL that we wrote and we have a compiler for it in order to be able to have a, a DSL to have a language specifically ex for expressing permissions. Um, other, other systems in the space don't use something like this because they're not fundamentally about providing guidance on how to interpret a graph. They're usually policy languages, 
So for example, like um, OPA uses Rego, which I believe is a, a dialect of data log for expressing constraints and then evaluating whether those constraints all come out to be true or false. Completely different paradigm from something that's relationship and graph-based. Graph Sound good? Cool. Yep. Um, so yeah, like I said, our schema is a DSL and a custom compiler. Um, what it does is it basically adds type restrictions on the relationships and then compiles, compiles down the permissions to something that gets stored with each object type. Um, the goal here, because speed is one of our primary concerns, speed and scalability, is that we want to be able to deserialize the object type and go. Right? So we want to just be able to deserialize it and start interpreting right away. One place where we haven't invested in yet um, are compiler optimizations. So there are probably opportunities to find patterns, uh, common patterns of usage, common patterns where we can uh, basically compile these permissions computations down to something either more cacheable or optimized for on a different metric. Okay, so that's our schema. Next up, we have the API and execution. So our network API is fundamentally just CRUD operations on the relationships, and then a few specialized operations that are tailored for permissions. Um, so we have the expand relation, which just gives you the direct objects, like one level removed from the objects that you've queried. We have check permission, which is the most important. That's the one that's making yes or no decisions about whether someone is allowed to access something. And then we have lookup, which is the most novel uh, API that we've added um, versus the Zanzibar paper. And lookup is a way to start at the subject and walk the graph backward to get back to the resources that you have that particular permission on. Down below, I have a link to our API. Um, it's a gRPC API, and you can see it on the buff schema registry. So here's just a quick example about how we traverse the graph to make a permissions decision. Um, so we're trying to see if user Jill has the view permission on some document. Um, I use the same graph from before. Um, and so what we do is we start at view and we, we walk to the various places that we can get to, right? We, we walk to all of the nodes that are downstream of view and see if user Jill appears in any of them. Um, first we walk reader and we see that user Jill is not a reader. Then we walk down to edit. And then from edit, we go to owner. We find that Jill is. So from that point, we can already make our determination that she's allowed to have view on this document. And we'll also check the admin path to see if Jill is an admin on the organization to which this document belongs. Okay. So the next and super important part about our API is we have this concept called Z tokens. So Z tokens represent a specific point in time. Um, as you can imagine, as you know, mutations are being made to the underlying data and mutations are being made to the permissions themselves, all of this is happening in sort of like an external, externally uh, observable order. And we wanna make sure that we can sort of uh, respect that order in order to get that um, consistency guarantee we talked about earlier. What Z tokens allow us to do, they allow us to make requests with slightly older, but data that still has all of the relevant uh, mutations that we're concerned with. They're opaque to the caller. Um, they're fundamentally just a serialized protobuf, so they're not very opaque, um, but they are opaque. And the intention is that they live with the data and they're updated when the data is. So if the system that you're protecting data on is eventually consistent as well, then the um, consistency guarantees that you need only need to be as consistent as the replication of the underlying data. Um, I know that's a lot to swallow. I have an example in just a second. And the most important thing is that they solve the new enemy problem. And so what is the new enemy problem? The new enemy problem is when you apply old ACLs to new content or when you evaluate changes to ACLs out of order. So you can imagine if I add someone to um, a band list and then I add them to a reader list, in that order, I never want them to actually be able to read. But if I evaluate those out of order, they'll be able to get access to data that they shouldn't have. So just as a quick example, we have a document here called plans. Um, we have two users. One user is called Lex and one user is called Kara. Lex has read access and Kara has admin access. At time T1, Kara removes Lex's reader permission. So Lex should no longer be able to read the document. 
At time T2, Kara uses her admin permissions to add secrets to the plans. So now the plans contain data that Lex should have never been able to see. At time T3, Lex attempts to read, but a stale ACL was used because the data wasn't replicated and we didn't have a mechanism for bringing that synchronization in line. Um, so Lex is actually allowed to see the secret plans. And then obviously he uses the secret plans to cause chaos uh, as Lexes want to do. <clears throat> so how would this change with Z tokens? Um, at time T1, Kara removes Lex's reader permission, just like before. At time T2, Kara adds the secrets and gets a Z token back from SpiceDB. Um, as we mentioned, the Z token is an opaque cookie that represents a point in time. At time T3, Lex attempts to read and a few different things happen. Um, the T2Z token is sent with the data that Lex is trying to read because remember that token is serialized alongside the data. That causes SpiceDB to use a fresh enough ACL. So it includes any changes that were made before T2, which happens to include Kara removing Lex's reader permission. And Lex is denied access because it's seen that the reader permission was removed. And everybody's happy because Lex isn't allowed to go and, and you know, do whatever he did to the building. Okay. Uh, are, those, so are, those, are those Z tokens, are they comparable? Like, like one comes for another? Keep they're comparable like, within SpiceDB. Yes. But they're not comparable externally. Uh, Alan, you have a question? Yes, thanks very much. Uh, if you could just go back to that example with the, the Z token, please. Um, how do you protect against Lex essentially keeping an old Z token and using that with their request. Um, so Lex, you know, yeah, so Lex isn't the one who's responsible for passing Z tokens. So the Z tokens are being stored and sent back to the permission service by the data store that, like by the, the service that's serving the secret plans. I see. So you can imagine okay. you have like a plans backend service with a get API. That itself is the one who's sending the Z tokens. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the, the cookie, we went back and forth on whether to have any association with cookies because cookies obviously have a meaning on the web, right? There's something you give to a user and a user gives back to you. Um, but in this case, they're slightly different. They're for backend to permission service synchronization or, or causal ordering. Okay, so diving into the architecture and implementation, uh, this is gonna be a little bit of an eye test um, but what this is, is this is how all of the major source code components relate to one another. Um, over on the left, we have where the requests come in. We support both a, a REST API, but the primary API is actually a gRPC API. That gives you access to the CRUD operations against relationships and schema. Those CRUD operations, I mean, they go through a bunch of other uh, validation and uh, comp compilation machinations. But fundamentally, they, they are talking directly to the data store. So they don't go through any kind of interpretation um, like the permission specific ones do. In the top, in the red, blue, and green uh, boxes, we have the permission specific APIs. So check permission, that's whether you, where you find out if someone is allowed to do a thing to a resource. Expand was loading that next level of uh, the graph. And then look up was the reverse graph lock. Those get sent to a dispatcher. The dispatcher determines how to actually solve those, those questions, those queries that the user has made. Um, they send those out to specialized version of the dispatch API, which then will often send the request onto another SpiceDB node uh, that we hope will do a quote unquote better job of answering the question. Uh, and we'll talk about what exactly makes it a better job in a few slides. The data store here is shown talking directly to CockroachDB but it is an interface um, with multiple implementations and a few others under active development. Uh, so like I said, we can sit on top of CockroachDB. That's sort of like our preferred open source default because it's globally replicated. Um, but we also support like Postgres, we have an in-memory driver, and then a few more uh, in development. What, what component in this diagram is giving out that tokens? Um, the API itself, the, the gray box far on the left, there's a middleware which basically calculates what timestamp this request is being served at and then gives that back to the user. 
that so for a given organization, do you have to go through a single gray box? Go through a single, uh, no, no. Um, it, it's, it's relying on the downstream data store implementation to give us a sense of absolute time. So in Spanner, absolute time comes from the atomic clocks. In CockroachDB, they have a hybrid logical clock, which untangles it all. In Postgres, we have a custom um, MVCC implementation that has a transaction counter that's monotonically increasing. So that one is sort of the most single point of failure of all of them. Uh, but any of the gray boxes can talk to the data store and get its sense of now. And often they don't even have to talk to the data store to pick a timestamp. And I have like a whole example about how timestamps get picked um, in just a few slides. Okay. Um, just a few more implementation details. So like I said, we are a gRPC API primarily. We do that for the HTTP2 uh, parallelism, pipelining, and the type safety. Uh, and that also does the request validation from a package called proto -gen validate. That's sort of like syntactic request validation. Then we have a whole semantic request validation layer on top of that. SpiceDB itself is written in Golang. We chose Golang because we're familiar with it, first and foremost. Go routines make parallel uh, execution and parallel computation really, really fun and elegant. Um, it's fast enough. And obviously we did it for the generic support, which is landing in two-ish weeks. Uh, just kidding. We had no idea that we were going to need that so badly. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the data store implementations, we have uh, Cockroach, Postgres, in-memory, and then a couple more under development. In the beginning, I mentioned that this is a globally distributed service. So in the Zanzibar paper, they talk about basing Zanzibar on top of Google Spanner. If anybody's unfamiliar with Spanner, Spanner is uh, a globally distributed ACID database that can do a, like a global atomic transaction. Um, it's fully linearizable and it uses atomic clocks for getting uh, perfect ordering, perfectly externally viewable um, linearizable ordering. Um, we use CockroachDB, like I mentioned. There is, uh, CockroachDB is slightly less linearizable than Spanner. Um, I could give a whole talk just on that if we wanted. Or slightly less, it's not linearizable. It is not linearizable. Um, <laughs> their mantra is no stale reads. Um, and you can force things to be linearizable if you make the transactions overlap, uh, which is essentially what we have to do. Um, because CockroachDB and Spanner are derived from sort of the same uh, underlying principles for how they distribute data, we can use Spanner performance as a proxy for what we can expect out of CockroachDB. Um, and one of the things in the actual Spanner paper is that one of Spanner's customers at Google called F1 basically kept metrics on the response times that they got back from Spanner. Um, the 8.7 millisecond mean read latency is very good. Uh, the 376.4 millisecond standard deviation read latency is very bad. Um, so the reason this happens is if the data isn't already replicated into the node that you're trying to read from, uh, Spanner will go and get the data for you, regardless of where that data is. Um, so this could mean dragging the data across an undersea fiber cable, um, right? Which is where we get some of these higher tail latencies. Um, and obviously, super high tail latencies make for super poor user experiences. So the realization that the Zanzibar team had and you know, the solution that we've copied is we need to make as few calls to storage as possible. So how do we accomplish that? Um, well, first, this doesn't directly address it, but we need to break down uh, the problem into parallel subproblems. Then we can cache each and every subproblem um, we can reuse the cache as much as possible. And I'll go into how we do this by picking intelligently picking timestamps. We want to deduplicate requests. So a lot of times, a lot of things in the graph will converge down to a, a, few, a few clusters of nodes. For example, if you have a really popular group or really popular user or like a really popular object, like a YouTube video, for example, um, you'll end up redoing the same requests from a lot of different places a lot of different times. We wanna try and batch our reads to the data store. So it's often just as efficient to load 100 relationships as it is to load one. And we want to uh, pre-compute the transitive closure of some of the objects. Um, we do that through a system that's under development called Tiger Cache. Uh, it's not available yet, 
The Zanzibar paper does it through uh, a system called Leopard, which they only use for groups, as far as I understand. So group, groups of groups, groups of groups of groups, things like that. All right, so I'm gonna walk through an example of how we break a problem down into subproblems. Um, this is pretty straightforward. So the top level question that we asked before was, is Jill, can Jill view some document? Um, this is fundamentally a union of a few subproblems. So one of the subproblems is Jill directly a reader of the document. Um, we can evaluate that and say that no, Jill is not. We can evaluate another subproblem, which is does Jill have edit on some document? And that itself is another union. It's a union of whether Jill is an owner of the document, which of course she is. But then the other branch of the edit is, is Jill an admin of the organization that the document belongs to? And of course she's not. So we have a few different subproblems there and each subproblem can be uh, evaluated independently and the results can be combined to make the top level uh, determination. So yeah, as we saw, two of the branches or I guess sort of three of the, yeah, two of the branches that we explored did not yield uh, that Jill had permissions and one of the branches did. Okay, so one of the ways that we can improve our cache hit rate, um, remember we talked about nodes distributing requests and sub-requests to other nodes, is we can pick nodes that are already likely to have computed the answer. So we do this by putting all instances of SpiceDB in a consistent hash ring. Um, if you're familiar with a consistent hash ring, it is a way to subdivide an address space. Uh, in this case, we're pretending that this hash yields an integer. So every request that we hash will yield a, an integer that's as unique as possible for that particular request. Um, and then the address space gets subdivided and things that map to portions of that address space get sent to the nodes that have claimed responsibility for it. Um, one of the really cool things about a consistent hash ring though, is that every node can independently come up with the same hash ring without having to coordinate amongst themselves. So the way you do that is you hash the members, you hash the participants in the hash ring themselves, assign them a position or assign them usually many, many, many positions on the hash ring. Um, and then in that way, all of the nodes can follow that same algorithm for populating this hash ring to get the same consistent view. Okay. Um, each of, so in this diagram, we have one top level problem, which is whether Jill can view the sum document but then we also have a sub problem, which was whether Jill could edit uh, some document. In this case, the top level problem went to node two. Node two figured out that uh, some document edit was a sub problem and then sent that on to node one, which is responsible for that, that set of sub problems. Okay, um, I'll pause here in case there's any questions. I imagine a lot of people are familiar with consistent hash rings, but just in case. All right. So that's just one of the ways that we want to uh, improve cache hit rate. Um, the next way is we want to actually recognize that at any given point in time, decisions are actually immutable. So if we say that before, you know, at time T1, if we computed that Lex had permission to read the document, any, any permission that we evaluate at time T1 will always return uh, that Lex does have permission. Then we want to pick timestamps that already have globally replicated data. So this goes back to that spanner, that uh, standard deviation that we saw of 370 some milliseconds. We want to try and pick uh, timestamps where spanner is confident that the data has already been replicated everywhere that it needs to be. And finally, we want to pick timestamps that can be shared because if everybody were just randomly picking times, uh, they would be very unlikely to pick the same time and therefore we would be unable to reuse the same decisions. So here's a diagram of how we do that. Um, this is a timeline. It reads like many that you're familiar with. Things in the left happened earlier than things on the right. Um, in this case, we have an ACL that was updated. This is similar to uh, Jill issuing the, Jill removing Lex from the, the readers of the document. Then at some point later, the document was updated and a Z token was issued. So that's the second box from the left. Um, the third box represents the point, the, trailing point through the sort of data log that's already been replicated globally. So if we read data from any point on the left of that third box, we expect that we can read it locally. And if we read it from the right of that third box, we expect that we may have to go get the data from a remote server somewhere. 
And then the last box is a request that was made with the Z token. So this is a request that a user made or a request made on behalf of a user that includes the Z token that was issued in box two. Okay. So first, because a Z token enforces that we evaluate at a timestamp at least as fresh as the Z token, we can eliminate everything to the left of the first box. We cannot pick a time to the left of the first box to evaluate our permissions request. Next, we wanna pick uh, a timestamp from data that's already been up, up, uh, replicated globally. And again, we do that because we wanna make a local read as often as possible. One thing to note, if the Z token time were to the right of the replicated globally time, we would have to essentially just pick the Z token time because there is no globally replicated time that we can lean on. This will, you'll often find this when like um, a permission is updated and then checked immediately, like to drive a UI for viewing those permissions. And then the last thing we do is we quantize the timeline to try and create those timestamps that everybody can rally around. Um, so these timestamps are more likely to be cacheable because you're more likely to get uh, many different requests requesting evaluations at the same timestamp. This is a tunable. So this is something that you, the user of SpiceDB can set the quantization period, um, but it's also directly related to cache hit rate and also whether you're able to find a timestamp that meets all of the other requirements. Um, so in this case, we do happen to have three candidate timestamps that we can use that are both after the Z token was issued, but also at a time when we expect the data to be globally replicated. Okay. And that's kind of, yeah, that's all the magic behind timestamp selection. So again, so you're basically going to the data servers, so give, give me your notion of time and multiple servers are doing this. And then somehow you'll be able to say, you're just rounding up and say, give me the next nearest, what, 20 seconds or, or, or you know, minute or something like that. That's yeah, your conversation. We're, we're usually rounding down. Um, okay. We use five second quantization periods. Um, that's pretty aggressive. Um, we may change that in the future to get better uh, cache hit ratio. But yeah, we're usually rounding down. Um, and then you don't always have to go to the data store. So for example, if you know that the Z token was requested with a time that is sufficiently old to not talk to the data store, you can just sort of directly quantize it. Uh, so the guy comes trying to do the read later on. He's got an old Z token, and locally you know that uh, it's within you know two minutes of, of the last refresh or something like that. So therefore, you just you block it right then and there. Um, yeah, basically, if the if the Z token is older than the consistency window of the clocks of our data store, yeah, then we can just say it's sufficiently old that we can just quantize from a period where we don't have to go to the data store and ask it, what time do you think now is? Because now is totally irrelevant. Yes. So, so, they mean, okay, so basically every five seconds you're going to the data store, what's your time, what's your time, what's your, what's your time? We go to the data store more frequently than five seconds, um, but yeah, yeah, we're keeping track of what time the data store thinks it is, what time we think it is locally, what the um, sort of uncertainty window is, between the what the data store has promised us its uncertainty window is, and then making decisions about wh what we have to do with time based on that. So for example, uh, Spanner's uncertainty window is seven milliseconds. Yeah. Um, CockroachDB's in the Cockroach Cloud uh, data store that we're using, their uncertainty window is I believe 500 milliseconds. So we take that into account when we pick our, our timestamps. You only have to do this because the like cockroach is not linearized works and doesn't have external consistency, right? So you're graphing this on top of it, but Spanner does. So if Spanner, you don't need a Z token or that, but it, it helps for caching. So that's what you Correct. need it. Yeah. Got it. And you still, you still want to pick an older time to evaluate at in order to be using the data that's already cached or data that's already been replicated. So Alan is Alan Fetke, Fetke on this call is the, the number one database researcher in all of Australia. Alan, are you okay with this scheme? I want to think it through. It sounds yeah. reasonable, but yeah, <laughs> these things get tricky. 
Um, I'm particularly interested in the uh, idea of having the, I mean, the Z token is essentially a, a, a restriction on the staleness. And that's uh, something that is a very good idea in a lot of cases, but you have to make sure that they're propagating carefully and, and that especially I'd be interested in how it interacts with causal uh, ordering because a lot of uh, this, um, you, you, you know, the, the new enemy issue that you, you mentioned, really a lot can happen with causal transition of information. So you have to make sure that the, the times here respect all of that. I want to think it through. It sounds like a very good idea and worth a lot of research. So the, the thing that's sort of novel um, is that a lot of distributed systems start with something that's eventually consistent and they layer on consistency, right? Like they, they layer on things like cookies and tokens to raise their consistency or they do like quorum reads, for example. Um, Zanzibar starts from Spanner, which is already linearizable and adds this mechanism as a way to improve performance. So it's starting from a much, like a much safer posture and then relaxing that to get better performance. Um, so it's, it's not saying like, I'm going to try and make a determination on my own. It's just saying, I'm going to use a consistent snapshot view of the database at a time where there are some external guarantees. Alan. Alan is the number one transaction expert in the Southern hemisphere, not just Australia. No. Okay, uh, that's a, that's definitely a small set. <laughs> You're underselling them. All right, sorry, Josh, go or Jacob, work. Cool. Um, all right. So I guess we should talk about how we've done with this whole system. So we've got uh, some real-world performance measurements that we've made against uh, authz.com, which is running SpiceDB in the back. So our check API response duration at the 95th percentile is 22 milliseconds. Um, 20 milliseconds seems to be a good goal uh, for, for these things that are parallelizable by default. You can make many check requests at once. Uh, so 20 milliseconds is a nice user sweet spot because that's going to get added onto any other latency. Um, our API availability, it says 100%, but obviously nothing's ever 100%. You'll see there are some little dips in the graph where we go down to like 99.993%, things like that. Um, these are all uh, publicly visible at our dashboard, um, status.authz.com. We've talked a lot about cache hit ratio. Um, our cache hit ratio, we track it separately uh, between the client and server caches. So when you're distributing from one node to another, first you see if you have it cached um, on the, the server side, so you don't even have to go and make the network request to the other node. Um, but then we're also tracking it on the uh, client side. So that's the one that we expect to have it because of that consistent hash ring. Um, our cache hit ratio is around 65%. We think we can make this better by getting a little bit less aggressive with our quantization periods um, and through some other tricks involving uh, compilers on our schema. But we don't have to evaluate these metrics uh, in a vacuum. Zanzibar was uh, nice enough to publish some metrics in their paper. Um, so first is the 99th percentile on checks at safe timestamps. Safe timestamps in Zanzibar parlance are those that include data, only include data that's already been replicated globally. So they're doing 15 milliseconds at the 99th percentile, which is unarguably better than our 22 milliseconds at the 99, uh, 95th percentile. Zanzibar's availability over the past three years has remained above 99.999%. Um, we're not there yet. Part of the reason uh, that they are able to do that so well is because Google actually controls their own network. Um, but we are doing pretty well, uh, I think, with our approaching that. And then unfortunately, Google didn't publish cache hit rates for Zanzibar, um, but Airbnb did. So they made an implementation of Zanzibar called Himeji internally for uh, calculating uh, permissions across the Airbnb platform, and they've achieved a 98% uh, cache hit ratio. They're doing things a little bit differently. They don't have Z tokens or Zookies, um, but it's a nice aspirational goal 
for us to try to get to uh, something in the like 90% plus hit rate. Um, this is just a for fun flight. Um, in terms of how a system like this that has no sort of single point of failure uh, and is widely horizontally scalable, uh, Zanzibar serves more than 10 million QPS um, and it does it across 10,000 servers in several dozen clusters around the world. Uh, we are not there yet, uh, but we hope to. Right? We hope to build a system that can scale to those kinds of heights. All right, uh, and that's SpiceDB. Just as a quick recap, uh, we're ushering in a new authorization paradigm for people outside of Google. Uh, it's relationship-based rather than role-based. We put the data and the schema together to give you that consistent network view um, that multiple services and multiple applications can all sort of rally around and put together. Uh, we want scalability before expressibility. So if you do a system like the policy evaluators that are built on top of data log, that's great, and you can express some really amazing things in those systems, but you're probably not going to get to 20 million QPS, um, at least not with the same sort of ordering guarantees that you get with Sansibar and with SpiceDB. Um, and yeah, there's always room for performance improvement. So we've seen how some of these other implementations are doing out in the world, and we want to get there. And that's all I've prepared. So thanks for watching. Um, this is a link to our Discord. Our Discord is where we talk about development with the community, uh, where we do some of our planning. It's where users help each other out, um, things like that. So I encourage you to join uh, if this is interesting from a implementation or a contribution perspective. Okay, awesome. questions? Okay, I, I will applaud that for everyone else. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Alan, go for it. Actually, a question not connected with the transactional consistency type topics. Um, in the part where you were indicating how you evaluate, for example, if Jill has access, essentially by looking at the downstream of various nodes and intersecting those things. Um, yeah. what, what happens when you have a query whose evaluation requires negation? in that so you know you mentioned the one of somebody who you know if if they're banned they must not have access no matter what um how do you do this of sort of evaluation because simply looking downstream and finding the union of all the downstreams isn't good enough wait um you wait for all of the other branches that can possibly negate it to come back with their answers before you make your final decision. And that can happen at any, at any point in the tree. Uh, you can have to wait, but often you can still make your decision before you get all of the downstream answers back. So for example, if it's an exclusion and the banned branch shows up right away and you find out that this user is banned and there's nothing that could sort of reverse that decision anywhere else in the schema, you can say, nope, not happening, right? Um, similarly for intersection, as soon as one branch completes and that user is not on that side of the branch, then you can return. There's no possible way the other branch could make this evaluate to true. So we're returning now. Doesn't that require a lot of clever, um, essentially compiler analysis of the, the structures of the, the formulae? Um, not really. Uh, so the way this gets compiled down is the permission would essentially say this permission is the exclusion is what we call it when it's a, a set difference. This is the exclusion of this base set and these other sort of operands. Um, and when you have that exclusion, you just send out the subproblems for the base set and each individual operand. And as the data comes back in, you just make your determination upstream or not. And the hope is that all of those things will be cached or many of those things will be cached because the subproblems themselves are, uh, you know, they don't change, they're immutable. Thank you. Steven, go for it. Hi, my name is Steven. Thank you for the talk. Um, on the question of resolving, for example, on a Google Docs example, whether someone can access the document, let's say in the viewer permission. And oftentimes in Google Docs, there's the concept of groups. So you can be a member of a group, a group can be of group. In this arbitrary deep tree, does your system actually bang 
the resolution time, whether I'm a member of a group that have access to the document, um, just using Google Docs as an example, or do you actually pre-render some type of bitmap so you can control the bang of your resolution time? Great question. Um, as of right now, we do not bound the resolution time. So we wanna give you a correct answer. Um, actually, I take that back. There is a boundary in our authsed.com uh, version of one second on all requests. So after one second, we'll tell you, we just don't know, it's too complicated. Um, but we will never give you, like we'll never say that, oh, maybe, or like, yeah, go ahead, go for it. Um, so we'll tell you we don't know before we tell you like a wrong answer. However, the Zanzibar paper and um, a thing that we're working on does actually handle the nested group problem. So that was the pre-computing the transitive closure of objects. So when groups belong to other groups and those groups themselves belong to groups, you can actually go and you can say for this top level group, what are all of the, the sort of leaf objects that belong to this group transitively? And you store that denormalization to turn this sort of like uh, nested serial data store back and forth to something that is, is denormalized, done ahead of time. And then you just have access to that data when you need to make the query. I see. The, thing, we're, the thing that we're working on is a system called Tiger Cache. Um, and the Tiger Cache will allow us to compute that. And it will allow us to also yield a, um, excuse me, a roaring bitmap, which is essentially a way to, uh, I probably don't need to explain it to this group, but it's a way to export um, essentially a database index from one database and put it into another and use that as sort of like um, a conditional on your query. I see. Um, for example, like in the Google example, because there are so many people ops operation, you have people joining Google, leaving Google, and you have a, let's say some entity document that is controlled by, oh, you have to be a, uh, some Google internal groups. Won't that be very busy for your cash? Cause you always almost like, oh, like Monday morning, every week, there's a bunch of activity. You have to keep recomputing the, the pre-render bitmap such that you can resolve the, <laughs> the membership correctly. Yeah, um, so it's actually much worse than that um, because this isn't just for Google internal systems. This is also for like, you know, Google Docs, Google.com Docs, right? So, you know, billions of people in the world interacting with Google Docs uh, or at least YouTube, maybe not Google Docs. Um, but yeah, you're right. So what they talk about in the, the Zanzibar paper, they have the Leopard system that does this transitive closure. And they say that a single write uh, a single relationship right to Zanzibar will often manifest itself into tens of thousands of rights against that denormalized cache. So yeah, it's a, it's a Google scale problem. Cool, thank you. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I guess a few, few questions. Thanks for this talk, it's quite interesting. We don't uh, <clears throat> see papers on this topic in database conferences as much. So um, I guess one question I had was similar to what Alan said. What happens if you end up with a conflict, right? Like with the, with the exclusion that like under the reader role, for instance, you end up with a negative constraint or negative rule, but then under admin, you end up like there are two paths to that same permission, right? Uh, either through as a sort of a direct association of the document or through like a group, right? And can such a situation arise? Like, I'm not quite sure how you would resolve conflicts like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So th that, that happens all the time. Um, and the way to resolve it is, let me see, in the schema example. Yeah, so these things have an order, right? These operations have an order. Um, so for in this example, you have a path, like in the exclusion, you can be banned or you can be a reader, right? The way this gets compiled the subproblem of whether you're a reader gets evaluated. And then the subproblem of whether you're banned gets evaluated. And if you are banned, then you are subtracted from the group of readers, right? That's the way to read this. So similarly, there needs to be a convergence point for any permission where your permission gets uh, aggregated under a single named permission. It's usually something like view, but in the, in the admin case, right? Like 
If you were an admin, but you were also banned, it would just depend on where admin was brought in, whether it was on the left-hand side of the exclusion or on the right-hand side of the exclusion. But I'm wondering about a situation where I have something like this, where through a direct relationship with the document, I'm in the band mode, but I also have per admin permissions with the group that has the same permissions to the document. No, it might be maybe that just can model happen. it out. Yeah, that's, that's fine. We don't need to, uh, I guess I, sort of a related sort of separate way to look at it is, did you kind of have a formalism where given this basically graph, you're able to consistently show what those uh, permissions resolve to? Is that something that's in a write-up or something? Right. Uh, one of the interesting things that maybe was missed was see where, see here in the edit permission where we bring in the organization's administrators. Can, right. can you see that? Yeah. Um, so in this case, like, let's pretend there was a minus sign to the right of that, that subtracted out the banned people. Okay. Um, in that case, the owner and the org admin would be evaluated before the people were subtracted out. So in that particular manifestation of the permission expression, the banned people would take precedence over whether you were an org admin or a member of a group or not, right? But in the case where maybe um, org admin, maybe it was owner minus banned in parentheses, and then org admin was unioned with that after the fact, then you still have a deterministic order because the org admin now takes precedence over whether you've been banned from being an owner. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense in this case. Maybe I just need to think this through a little bit um, because I don't, I don't see how this maps onto the actual graph that you have and, and what it looks like on that graph. Okay. But maybe I'll think about it and reach out to you if I have a yeah. question on that. And yeah, I guess I'm the second- I'm happy to discuss it. We also have our playground, which is where I would usually go and kind of like live model these concepts um, and show how it, how it all fits together. And I guess sort of a separate question is how how complex do these graphs get? Right? Some of the things I was thinking of probably don't make sense uh, in real world, but I'm just curious, like how complex do these things get? How deep do they get? Uh, I wish I could show you the permissions graph uh, from one of our users because it's it looks like a like a Hubble deep field image of a far off right. galaxy. Um, they can get very very complicated. Interesting. Um, in the Zanzibar paper, they actually talk about at Google, um, I think they, the average length of a policy document is like 1,500 lines, um, something along those lines. Right, but it's not like the, it's probably the depth of the thing that makes a difference to some of your you know, transitive closure or other kinds of computations. Right? Because I suspect those get messy if you have like ACL changes and then you know, you have to invalidate those transitive closures and I suspect that that gets more messy with uh, deeper graphs rather than sort of taller graphs. Absolutely. Um, there's definitely like a critical path that arises in most of the graphs. Um, so often you can prune some of the more complex branches by whether they were already in, like given that permission through a union with something simpler. Uh, but sometimes you do have to go all the way to the, the bitter end of uh, one of the most complicated relationships. All right, thanks. Uh, Mo is the premier database professor at U University of Maryland, and his beard looks amazing. Nice job, Mo. Um, all right, I, <laughs> I have a last question. So, like, what are the SQL queries that 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 your thing emits? What do they actually look like? Are they like real simple, like get this, get that? Are they more complex joins? Um, and then you mentioned batching to reduce the number of of lookups on against the database itself. Like are you batching like within a single request, like a JDBC, uh, like batch individual queries? Or are you rewriting them like multiple selects into a single select statement? And how? And if if, if it's the latter, how sophisticated is that sort of optimization step that you have now? Yeah. Um. So the first part was, what do the SQL queries look like? We're basically treating these things as triple stores, so they're very simple. They're give me the list of relationships that match this set of criteria. And the set of criteria is determined by what, you know, where you are in the graph and what you're directly trying to evaluate. Um, the batching, we do some very naive batching where we put separate SQL queries together 
in a sim uh, like a single network call. Um, the uh, the we're not using SQLX. What's the we're using PGX, which is a library for Postgres um, for talking to CockroachDB. And PGX has its own concept of batches, where you can basically make a single network round trip. Um, that didn't actually save us very much. Um, the batching that we do is like we will load more relationships than we need if we think it might be useful for a different part. Um, but this this is all actually like very naive at this point, um, and probably a lot of room for improvement there. So it's basically if you so if you use the driver to do batch calls of like multiple single statement queries, that didn't win anything. But it sounds like you are doing some query rewriting to go get more data than that could could service multiple requests. Within a yeah, it's more like um, we'll load a few extra rows if like we, yep. there it could be that one single row could answer our request already like if a specific object ID is there but if there's like something more broad uh, we, we can use uh, that and just load extra rows um, we're also using like type information from the the graph itself for type information from our schema to like make optimizations about what we go and fetch um, but that's not batching per se.